Experience Weekly Data Talk, a show featuring some of the smartest people working in data science. Today, we're excited to feature Bina Amanap, who is the founder and CEO of Humans for AI, and she also serves as the Global VP of Data, Artificial Intelligence, and New Tech Incubation at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Bina, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for ha- you know being on our show. It's an honor to have you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me on your show. So I thought it'd be great if, if we can kind of just kick this off. Tell us a little bit about why you started Humans for AI. Yeah, so I'm going to date myself here, Mike, but uh, uh, back in the early 90s when I was in college, you know, uh, we, we had artificial intelligence as one of the courses and no, nobody really wanted to do it because it was um, considered so futuristic and, you know, self-driving cars are uh, never going to happen. Personalized marketing, you know, impossible to do, right? We were still, and this was just like if you look at it, it was just a few decades ago, right? In our own lifetime, and now a lot of those things are happening. And uh, so that was one data point for me to see how things that we thought would never happen is happening. And the other big data point is also, uh, you know, if you think about it, the internet and the mobile, right? It started in the computer science world. It started in the tech industry, but it really impacted everybody. It doesn't matter what your profession is today, right? You have a phone. You are connected to the internet. So yeah, I th- I see this a very similar thing going to happen that's going to happen with artificial intelligence. No matter what your job is today, it's going to change either significantly or slightly depending on the actual role itself. But AI is going to be so pervasive, right? And we've seen it with internet and mobile. So it's that, uh, you know, that history gives me the, gives me that uh, ability to see what's going to happen with AI. And I think we have an opportunity because we miss the wave with internet and mobile. Uh, And what I mean by that is that if you look at it, internet and mobile created new job types, Mm. right? Like iOS developer. Right. <laughs> right. There was nothing called an app iOS developer, an app developer, or UX designer. It didn't really exist, right? And AI is going to create a lot of new jobs. So that was one part of mm. it. The other part of it is, you know, knowing artificial intelligence and what we're trying to do, which is really about. Uh, you know, automating uh, work that we do more uh, routinely, right? And I know AI is still in its early phases, but uh, later on, we're going to need deep domain experts who are going to drive the uh, the AI products for their professions. Like today, it's computer scientists like me who would interview, say, a lawyer and then go and build an, a legal AI product or similarly for healthcare. But, you know, five, 10 years from now, we're going to need these domain experts actually driving the product mm. design and the product, how, what the product should look like for their specific domain. So knowing that and then combining it with my passion for getting more women, more minorities into tech, I just saw this opportunity where uh, we know the, 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 there are new jobs that's going to be created. How do we actually get more women and minorities to be doing those newer jobs, right? If we knew that iOS developer would be a new career go or career path um, 30 years ago, we could have actually, you know, trained more women and minorities and then women in tech or this whole issue around lack of women in tech would not have existed, right? So that's the attempt uh, uh, with Humans for AI, to act, uh, proactively train women and minorities to be part of tech by learning more about AI, but staying in within their domain. And I, and I love that mission to, especially for people that are not in tech roles, because whenever I hear about um, AI positions, definitely, those roles, you know, usually require somebody who has a coding background, background in computer sciences or statistics and mathematics. And your organization is looking to bring AI out of tech and introduce it to people who are in, in general roles, like in communications, like you said, the legal field. Because in your opinion, like that's how we're going to see AI thrive in the future, right? With these domain experts 
right? Helping yeah. to. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, you know, Mike, I think today AI is still in its infancy. So we are really addressing the low hanging fruit, right? We're really going after solving very specific, narrow use cases using AI techniques. We're not going for the big game changers with AI. And uh, when we st start, when we reach, you know, the limits with narrow artificial intelligence is when we will start looking at, you know, truly expanding AI's own uh, capabilities in use cases. And that's where you'll need domain experts. And that's where, you, you know, you need a marketing person to be really telling how, what are the AI products that make sense from, from a marketer's perspective. And another data point to this is also that, um, you know, I, I have this friend who's a lawyer and he's always complaining about the mobile app that uh, somebody <laughs> has built for lawyers. And he's like, that's not how I work. You know, this is not what I do. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, it would have, you know, so, and especially with AI, you are now trying to capture the intelligence behind that profession, right? So you, you really need professionals driving the design. So today it's computer scientists, the data scientists, people who know R and Python and so on who are doing the coding. But I'm not talking about replacing those jobs, right? It's more on the product side, more on driving the vision around what AI should do for specific professions. The other part of, uh, to it is also we hear a lot of fear around AI because AI about AI going rogue. <laughs> and, um, part of it is also because it's not the domain experts who are driving uh, the mm. Who, who know all the nooks and crannies of their profession, who know all the guardrails that need to be put in place so that the intelligence doesn't go rogue. Um, and the fear exists because, you know, we don't have the domain experts deeply embedded in building the AI software that's being built today. Yeah, I'm seeing some comments here from Christina and Hesse. Domain experts will drive the design and vision for the professions. So when you talk about the different domain experts, um, Bina, can you talk, talk a little bit about um, other areas that you see for growth? Uh, in in terms of, um, for, in terms of, sorry. I, in, I, in terms of, because um, you mentioned the legal field, healthcare field, what other occupations do you see uh, where people can be become domain experts and help out with uh, AI technology? Yeah, by domain experts, I mean profession. So it can be accountants, it can be the finance people. The way we do accounting today, there's a lot of manual work that's involved, right? We use digital tools, but there's there's still a lot of auditing that needs to be done by humans. So how do you automate that piece? That's, that's again, low-hanging fruit or risk assessment, fraud detection. So by, uh, by domain experts, I mean profession. So we need surgeons involved. We need communication specialists involved. We need marketers. Um, anything that you can think of where there is, um, yeah, where there is um, more tasks that's using intelligence as opposed to the actual physical part. Uh, what I mean by that, like a job for a physical therapist is probably not going to be as impacted by AI, right? Because that's mm -hmm. more high touch. And it, it may change the way she works by put, having different systems, right? By For running her business, but not necessarily the actual job itself. So anything that uses human intelligence today, uh, any profession that uses that level of intelligence will then you know, I think those people should be learning about AI. And it also empowers these people, uh, you know, these folks to really shape on how AI should be driving changes in their industry, right? As opposed to having um, a completely different uh, profession driving these changes for across all industries. So what we really want to do is democratize AI, you know, make it easy for people to understand these concepts and, uh, you know, so if, if um, say, um, a, a, an accountant understands NLP or machine learning, and if you're able to explain it in a way that they can really relate to it, then they can say, ah, oh, this is how, you know, I would use it in my day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. 
in that way you're kind of you know using ai to make your day job better so that you can focus on the more human aspects of the job does that make sense i love that yeah definitely i mean i'm really excited about just the progress of chatbots and seeing how chatbots can work within organizations to help us all uh, be more efficient with our time and find information quicker for ourselves. And also voice assistants is just yeah. like two small examples, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. But that's gonna require, it's gonna require like training and it's gonna require that technology to like learn more about our work. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, all this stuff is happening so quickly. I mean, before we jumped on this chat, we were just chatting, you know, just talking about how, you know, five years ago, we're still talking about Google cars and making automated cars. And, and now it's like five years later, so much is happening in the AI industry. And I can't help it. Every single time I look on the web, there's some new article about AI doing this. <laughs> you have the, the, uh, the tabloid type headlines about rogue robots taking over the world. Yeah. And, and a lot of scary quotes out there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but I love, but I love you, but I love your, your viewpoint on like this is why we need to have more people involved uh, in helping to shape this AI technology because like you said we are still in the infancy stages yeah and you know a lot of the headlines are exaggerated and that is because there is so much hype and the uh, you know the, the fear exists right and that's why it is capturing uh, that's why it's tap the media is tapping yeah. into the hype <laughs> And it might, uh, it's, um, it's important to be aware of uh, how much of it is the truth. And if you really read through those articles, you'll see it's a very specific narrow use case. And then from then on, it's somebody's imagination that AI is taking over the world. Um, so I think it's important for more and more people to understand what AI is capable of. And I, I don't, I really don't mean it that they should know everything every little thing about how to build an AI program, right? But should be uh, understanding these core concepts. Now, I'm really curious as you were, because um, you got your MBA and your master's degrees and bachelor of science degree in computer science. I'm yeah. kind of curious about um, as you were going up the ranks, and obviously we see a huge gender gap in technology roles. I'm curious about how that kind of shaped you uh, as a student going into a data science profession and now having a having a drive to get more diversity you know i, I think now that i think about it there's not nobody with the title of data scientist <laughs> <laughs> so you know i don't I, I cannot say that i dreamt of being in this profession or i dreamt of doing this one day uh, I, I think it ca kind of naturally evolved uh, um it's um you know, I think computer science was something that attracted me just because of the math, uh, mathematics and statistics side of it. It's always been just natural and easy for me to understand and to grasp and to, I really enjoyed it too. So it was, uh, it, that was just a natural course for me to go into computer science. And within computer science, I found that, you know, databases, anything to do with data or looking at data was something that fascinated me. But I have to warn you, Mike, like when I was looking at databases, it was like FoxPro and DBase and Excel. So these are really antiquated software now, um, but very early stages, right? And today what we have with um, all, all the big data stuff going on, there is just, it, things have just changed, right? But the core concepts still hold true. Um, so, uh, and I think that's what has helped uh, me in my career to be able to have a good understanding of the core concepts in mathematics or you know, in core science, right? And people usually ask me, what language should I learn? What will help me grow? What will help me have a great career? And I'm like, it, it doesn't matter. It's about under, you know, having a strong foundation. Um, I think that you know, programming itself might not be done by humans for too long. It, uh, you know, we're going to reach a point where it will be people like you who are uh, you know, describing a problem statement. And if we do AI right, AI is going to do the programming for us, right? Um, so uh, 
I, I think it's more important for us to understand the core concepts and build out the foundation, uh, which really helped me in my career. Like, But throughout my career, one thing that I've stayed true to was the data part. Like every role that I've done uh, at, at different companies, I've worked across different domains, financial services, telecom, retail, e-commerce, um, IoT manufacturing, and now services. So, you know, I've just worked in different domains, but it's always been about data. So I've seen when data was more, um, more on a OLTP or a transactional database side where storage was super expensive and you have to think of ways of normalizing the data so you stored it in a very compact fashion. And then there, then came the phase of data warehouses and business intelligence, right? Where you could have the way you organize the data was different, um, whether it was star schema or the snowflake or so, so many different types. And that was more on how do we run our reports faster? How do we get, um, how do we look at the data to see what happened, right? To be able to look at trends. And then came the wave of big data, right? With the advent of Hadoop and the newer technologies, we are able to look at unstructured data. We are able to look at da data and combine it in a way that could not be done before. And now we're able to do that. So I've just seen this whole evolution of the data space. Uh, honestly, I think I got lucky that mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, you know, I uh, learned. Uh, you know, I grew up in the data space because this has truly changed so much in the past few decades and it has helped me grow and uh, because everything is built on the previous layer what i mean by that is when you know data warehousing and bi came into the picture there was a fear that the transactional databases would go away and it didn't right you still need it for your record keeping there's a place for it when uh, the big data space uh, big data technology started taking off there was a fear that the whole business intelligence or data warehousing space is going to go away and it didn't it's you know every step is kind of adding on on how we look at data and how we drive more insights from it and how we use it to drive uh, positive business outcomes one of the uh one of the other core missions of humans for ai is is the importance for diversity and i want to just ask you about why do you think diversity is so important for the future of AI technology? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying, Mike, is a lot of what we're trying to do with AI is so close to the intelligence that exists, right? And the classic example is um, um, a program that uh, was written by two uh, programmers, uh, uh, um, an AI program to identify shoes an image recognition program, right? And um, that the that could not, you know, it could recognize boots, it could recognize, you know, flip flops, but it could not recognize um, women's heels, shoes, right? The pumps with the heels, that it would not classify it as a shoe. And um, the reason was the the model was not trained with a diverse set of data mm. built by two male programmers and it just did not cross their mind to show that you know train the model on that data so that the model could recognize these kinds of shoes as well that's a simplistic example and that's almost seems trivial but when you think about it if you do not put enough diverse try, uh, diversity in the training data that you provide you do not bring, and when I say diversity, I'm not just talking about gender or racial diversity. It's also diversity of thought, diversity of um, your background, your experience, right? For AI to really thrive and reach its full potential, you need that diversity at the forefront. Otherwise, it's going to be these incomplete AI programs, mm -hmm. which just won't help AI's own growth. So for AI's own growth, I think diversity is needed. And I think that speaks to when data science leaders are looking to form their teams, having a diverse group of people who have different backgrounds, whether it's PhDs in mathematics, statistics, yeah. physics, right? Yeah. Um, biology, like people who um, are having, have different academic backgrounds can come to problems and will 
will will attempt to solve it in, in their own way and yeah. right but let me let me stop you right there you know even saying that you need a phd in diverse right. fields is is a uh, is not diverse right you need uh, people at different levels right so to really bring that diversity so it's diversity from every aspect yeah that that's totally true so i'll i'll share with you a, a quick little story yeah. um we have a data lab in san diego mm -hmm. and we're always recruiting different data scientists in lots of different fields and yeah. one of our latest hires she um she graduated with her bachelor's degree from UCLA i think like 2 years ago at mm -hmm. age 18 mm. stellar student brilliant yeah. her her um her degree was in statistics and as a hobby computer science was something she just played around with mm -hmm. and she ended up um UCLA every year has like a computer science competition. Yeah. And on a on a whim, she decided I want to enter this competition. Mm. She won. Yeah. She's not even a computer science major, right? But she has a strong stats background. And then as a hobby, she would do computer science on her own. So she yeah. ends up winning, right? Uh, this competition and our data lab snatched her <laughs> immediately, yeah. right? Because yeah. yeah. like you said, it doesn't require a PhD. Doesn't require a PhD. Doesn't require computer science. I actually know an uh, since you said um, Southern California. I actually know an actress who's uh, who's building a chatbot. Oh, and really? Yes. So it's a true. You know, diversity can come in so many different forms. Uh, but going back to uh, you know what you were referring to, right? When com uh, companies are building data science team, you know, to think that a data science team needs only data scientists. Is, is not going to help you succeed because mm -hmm. you need people who understand the business aspect of it. You need uh, great storytellers, visual designers who can actually communicate, you know, the findings from the models, right? You need to be able to tie it in with uh, uh, the business problem and show how it all fits together. So data science teams is actually a group of people who can really collaborate well. I think uh, just having data scientists is not going to give you that complete view or, or the success in a way that a diverse team that could could give, give it to you. Bina, if you were looking to hire on a brand new data science team, I mean, you just, you just mentioned all the different diversity you would want. What would be like kind of like the perfect team for you? Ah, I've, I've done that a few times and I'm actually <laughs> doing right now. So uh, it, I think um, having a data scientist, obviously, you know, who understands machine learning, uh, who has, um, um, I would look at different levels of experience, like right? somebody who has a PhD in machine learning has done it for, you know, several years, somebody who's just fresh out of the college, um, that part, then, you know, there's definitely need for data engineers because a lot of data science work is data janitorial work, cleaning up. The <laughs> I like that data janitorial yeah. work. It is janitorial. It's <laughs> messy, uh, like 80% of the work uh, to build a good model is in that janitorial work where you have to be able to source the data from the right sources, clean it, make sure the data quality is up to mark, um, prep it, make it ready before the data scientists can actually take over and start uh, building their model. Um, and then qu uh, QA is another big function of it. Um, ha you know, Being able to test, not only train the model, but test it on different data sets, that's crucial. And then uh, UX, user experience designing uh, uh, in a way where it's not just PowerPoint, much beyond PowerPoint, that's crucial as well. So I would mm -hmm. look for uh, you know people with different skill sets who can, you know, the core is still data science, but you're able to deliver an end-to-end -end solution which encompasses all this. Bina, what advice would you give for somebody who is applying for their job to join a data science team, they're interviewing with you, what would be some things you would be looking for and maybe some advice you'd give them? So I would, I usually look for more for the human skills first, the, you know, the team fit, the culture fit is very important for me. Somebody who can come in and actually, you know, gel in with the team and has the right attitude. 
Um, the, uh, the other thing I look for is curiosity. How curious is this person to keep digging through the data and find that nugget of information, that valuable piece that can actually help us drive uh, more productivity or uh, be bring better value, right? Um, so curiosity and collaboration, being able to work yeah. in a team environment, respect each other, as talent and the value that you bring to the table, uh, those are the three skills that I look for from a soft skill side. The uh, uh, you know obviously it's a uh, it's a given that you you uh, if you're interviewing with me, you've already passed the technical screen. <laughs> you know how to you know you're ninja at coding in Python or R or whatever your uh, coding language of choice is, and are very uh, savvy with the current technologies that exist. I know we only have a couple minutes left before we went on air. I was we were chatting about our kids, yeah, and and I want to talk a little bit about just really quickly. How are you preparing your kids <laughs> for the future of AI? Because I'm I'm wondering this right myself for my kids. Yeah, yeah. So I will tell you, they do not go for any programming lessons <laughs> classes. I am. Uh, I, I tell my. The son who is 14 to really focus on understanding the concepts, you know, try to uh, and al always think about how you would solve this problem differently. How would you solve mm. it if it was, yeah, ju just really leverage using your own human brain, right? Not try to depend fully on a computer or a calculator. They, they can be aids, but to build out the foundation. I think you need to run it through your own brain to get it the first time. I love that. Um, I'm going to put up the URL for everyone to see, humansforai.com. Bina, what will people find when they get there? They will find a website that is currently being rebuilt, but um, the at, at, what we're trying to do is really build out a, uh, where anybody, a community where anybody com can come in and learn more about AI and see how it applies to their profession. Our community has not only data scientists and the AI experts, but also has marketers, lawyers, and accountants. Mm. So we want to make this community, which is very open and welcome, where AI doesn't feel like, something that's accessible to only a privileged few, but it's something where everybody can come in, ask their questions, have honest, open conversations on how we shape this technology. Wonderful. Well, Bina, I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to encourage our data science community to check out humansforai.com. If you're interested in joining up, please get in contact with Bina or others there. There is a wonderful uh, community of people there that are helping to um, bring data science to the masses. So make sure to check out humansforai.com. Um, if you're new to Data Talk, you can always learn more about our weekly show and our podcast by going to experian.com slash data talk. And um, I want to thank everyone for watching. Thank you for your hearts, your shares, your comments here on Facebook Live. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much, Bina. Thanks, Mike. Have a good day. You too.